This program is brought to you by Suffolk University. Please visit us on the web at www.suffolk.edu. Good evening. My name is Jack Robel, and I'd like to welcome you to a very special event tonight. Uh, the Fort Hall Forum's First Amendment Awards honoring the Foundation for Individual Rights in Education. Uh, this event tonight is sponsored by some very good friends of ours, uh, Plymouth Rock Assurance Company, Prince Lowell, Glovsky and Tye, the Boston Bank and Trust Company, Mac McCarter and English, Bingham McCutcher, WBUR, and of course our partner, Suffolk University, which is now the home of the Fort Hall Forum. As most of you know, the Fort Hall Forum has for over a century conducted public, open, free lectures. Uh, we've brought together the, the, some very intriguing and thought-provoking people uh, to discuss the issues of the day. And I urge you to go onto our website and take a look at some of the people who've participated in the Fort Hall Forum. The First Amendment Award, which we're conducting tonight, is a natural outgrowth of the mission of the Ford Hall Forum. Quite simply put, our mission is free speech. Recognizing that a democracy can only work if, if the citizens are informed and the current issues uh, the day are discussed in a public forum. For your information, this program tonight is being recorded and if you do participate in the question and answer period later in the session, which we encourage you to do, uh, you are giving us rights to publish and to reproduce your questions. With that, I'd like to turn the floor over to uh, Don Tai, who is Vice President of the Fort Hall Forum, to make the presentations. I am not getting the award. I'm giving the award, but I appreciate the applause. Uh, this award uh, is given in the name of two individuals who were literally at the heart of the Ford Hall Forum, Lou and Evelyn Smith. Although Lou Smith had little education, he went on to make money in the textile industry and was then able to pursue his true calling, which was working for causes that he felt bettered humanity. Lou supported many Boston institutions, but the organization that was closest to Lou's heart was the the Ford Hall Forum. He was a lifelong learner and was passionate about being exposed to different ideas, controversial, non-controversial, popular, and uh, unpopular, and, uh, and, and the Forum is, is a legacy of, of Lou and Evelyn Smith. In the late 60s, Lou married Evelyn, the widow of a lifelong friend, and Evelyn shared many of the beliefs they had together in a true love of freedom of speech and thoughtful debate in both their own family and in the city of Boston, and we like to think that the Ford Hall Forum is a jewel of the city of Boston. This evening, in the spirit of passionate learning, active civic participation, and most importantly, the thoughtful exercise of rights of freedom of expression, the board of the forum has voted, and we had some very, very strong uh, competition, I might say, but we voted to present the 2010 Lewis P. and Evelyn Smith First Amendment Award to fire the Foundation for Individual Rights in Education. And I'd like to ask uh, Harvey Silverglade, uh, uh, Greg Lukianoff, and uh, Steven Pinker to please come up and each extend me one hand and I'll present this to the three of you. and take it away, <laughs> and you'll, you'll hear from each of them. Let me just say very, very briefly that the, that FIRE uh, effectively and decisively defends American liberties on behalf of thousands of students and faculty all throughout our nation's campuses. In case after case, FIRE brings about favorable resolutions for those individuals who continue to be challenged by those willing to defend fundamental rights and liberties within our institutions of higher education. In addition to individual casework, 
fireworks naturally to inform the public about the fate of liberty on our campuses. There's a very lengthy uh, uh, article about them and about the individuals. And I'd, I'd like right now to continue this evening's event by turning the microphone over to certainly one who knows about defending rights and liberties uh, here and throughout the country, uh, Judge Nancy Gertner of the United States uh, District Court, please. It is wonderful to be on the stage uh, with my mentor and one of my very dearest friends. I like to call him a mentor because then it's clear that he's older than I am. <laughs> Harvey is my mentor, but we'll get to that in a moment. I'm going to introduce the speakers. In the 1970s, when we cut our teeth as lawyers, uh, the United States had a profound and serious legacy of discrimination, the stain of slavery, the stain of the civil rights uh, struggles, uh, the stain of, Im of employment discrimination, gender discrimination em embodied in the law. And a number of laws were passed whose purpose was to eliminate and to stop that legacy. Uh, I remember I was in Yale Law School. I got into Yale Law School in 1968 when women were six, uh, there were eight women, rather, in a class of 160 because there were quotas against women getting into law school. And I only got in the following year after the eight because men were going to war and suddenly there were open slots. Um, I remember at Barnard there were speech and conduct codes of a different sort. Barnard speech and conduct codes in those days were intended to make certain that we married early, uh, that you could get in and out of a cab without someone looking up your skirt. Um, uh, but the discrimination laws, the currency of discrimination cases, and to some degree the currency of the discrimination laws, is speech. That's how discrimination is affected. And universities and employers were caught uh, in a bind, uh, in a hammerlock, if you will, trying to win their way between the requirements of these important laws on the one hand and that very critical amendment, the First Amendment, on the other. One way of looking at FIRE and the work that it has done is that its mission has been to help force, cajole, pressure uh, universities to navigate between those shoals, discrimination law on the one hand and the First Amendment uh, on the other. The first speaker, uh, I did research on him, I do research, and he appears to be a phenomenon. Uh, Steve Pinker is on the Board of Advisors of FIRE He's a Harvard College professor and Johnstone family professor of psychology at Harvard University. His research on visual cognition and the psychology of language has won prizes from the National Academy of, the Science, of Sciences, the Royal Institution of Great Britain, and the American so uh, Psychological Association. He has, he has written, rather, uh, uh, too many books for me to recite. Um, what I particularly like is that he's been named Humanist of the Year and is listed in Foreign Policy and Prospects Magazine as the world's, one of the world's top 100 public intellectuals and Time Magazine's the 100 most influential people in the world today. Sadly, I'm 101. <laughs> Mr. Pinker. <laughs> Thank you very much. It's a, a great honor to be speaking to the Ward Hall Forum, uh, all the more so in an event uh, designed to honor the Foundation for Individual Rights in Education. Uh, I'm an experimental psychologist. I'm interested in how the mind works, and that gives me two interests in the issue of free speech on campus. One of them is that I think that psychology is becoming the uh, science that is most likely to get people exercised about issues that they feel have great moral and, and cosmological import. It used to be that people were deeply concerned about cosmology, whether the Earth went around the sun or vice versa, and read uh, profound moral implications into that debate. That pretty much got settled. Then I think it was evolutionary biology. The battle is not quite won, but uh, clearly, uh, among educated people, it's clear that that's no longer uh, 
an open issue, whether life evolved by Darwin's mechanism of natural selection. Today, I think it is the scientific study of the mind that uh, <coughs> people tend to blend with deep moral issues. And I'll give you just a few examples of questions that have been raised by people in the field of psychology that have gotten them into trouble because even though they, in theory, are purely intellectual questions, uh, people believe that they uh, shake the foundations of morality. Uh, do most victims of sexual abuse suffer no lifelong damage? Uh, do women, on average, have a different average aptitude in mathematical reasoning than men? Uh, are Ashkenazi Jews, on average, smarter than Gentiles because their ancestors had been selected for the shrewdness needed in money lending? Is morality just a gadget that evolution installed in our brains with no inherent r reality? Are religious beliefs like parasites which colonize the minds of believers? Is the average intelligence of Western nations falling because duller people are having more children than smarter people? Do men have an innate tendency to rape? Do women who give birth under difficult circumstances have an innate tendency to abandon or even kill their newborns? Now, if you feel your blood pressure rising as you listen to this list of research questions, then you will have firsthand acquaintance with the fact that scientific or empirical questions can have moral colorings, or at least they can be perceived to have moral colorings. And the people who have raised these questions have often been uh, persecuted in ways that the Foundation for Individual Rights and in Education is well aware of. But as a psychologist, I have a, 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 a second and a deeper interest in this set of issues, which is why does our blood pressure rise? Why do the hairs on the back of our neck stand up when we entertain purely uh, intellectual research questions such as these? It brings up a uh, phenomenon called the psychology of taboo, the sensation that certain ideas are evil to think quite apart from the uh, fact, of course, that certain actions are evil to commit, but can it be sinful even to think a thought? Now, most of us would consider ourselves above this primitive mindset. The word taboo comes from animistic beliefs in uh, Polynesian preliterate peoples, and most of us consider ourselves above that. If you do, I'm going to invite you to um, entertain the following questions in social gatherings. So when you get home tonight, you and your spouse can have the following conversation. Darling, I know that you always have been faithful and always will be faithful, but just hypothetically, if you were going to have an affair, which of my friends would it be with? <laughs> or try this. Uh, in a dinner party, ideally one of uh, mixed ethnicity and religion, ask the question, well, of course, none of us here are prejudiced. But if we were, if you were bigoted, <laughs> which ethnic group would you be prejudiced against? Just <laughs> hypothetically. Uh, how much money would you accept to uh, betray your best friend, to spread confidential uh, information about him or her? Um, let's say you're an aged parent was uh, needed an expensive medical procedure that would prolong his or her life by two months or six months. Uh, how many thousands of dollars would you be willing to relinquish in order to grant your beloved parent those extra two years of life? Or uh, a couple of examples that have been the uh, focus of dramatic plots. Let's say the Nazis forced you to uh, give up one of your children, and if you refused to decide, they would uh, kill both of them. Which child would you give up? Of course, the plot of Sophie's choice. Or uh, if you were in financial dire straits and a wealthy man offered you a million dollars to sleep with your wife or with you if you're, if you're a woman, uh, would you accept? Now there was a, uh, there's a, a joke about that, that's of course the plot of Indecent Proposal, uh, where a man walking out of the movie theater with his wife said, would you sleep with Robert Redford for a million dollars? And she said, well, uh, yes, but they'd have to give me some time to come up with the money. <laughs> <laughs> now. With these questions, the longer you think about them, the more you incriminate yourself. Uh, the <laughs> answer to these questions is not 
to deliberate and then say, well, no, I wouldn't want to sleep with any of your friends, or I'm not, now that I think of it, there isn't any ethnic group that I'm prejudiced against. One must reject them instantly. Just allowing them to percolate in your brain is considered morally corrosive. And as a psychologist, I can recognize the function of this quirk of our psychology, namely, as we associate with other people, as we commit ourselves to our friends and our family, we care not just about what people think or what they do, but what kind of person they are. It's one thing if your friend or your spouse is, has been good to you so far, but are they always eyeing a possible better deal? Would they stab you in the back or sell you up the river as soon as the circumstances made it profitable for them? We don't want to have to constantly ask those questions, and so we seek life partners, coalition partners, friends who are committed through and through who would not even consider betraying us because it runs against every fiber of their makeup. That is why there is such a thing as the psychology of taboo, and all of those questions, uh, which theoretically should be innocent, in fact are corrosive because they require people to think exactly the kind of thoughts that they should not think if they are committed friends, allies, family members. Well, it makes a lot of sense from the point of view of our psychology, but now along comes this institution called uh, academia, or for that matter, journalism, government, uh, uh, the judicial system, which is, at least nominally, devoted to pursuing the truth no matter how uncomfortable it makes people emotionally. Uh, hence, we have the often emotional reactions to purely intellectual questions in all of these spheres of activity, and the dilemma of whether in these truth-seeking organizations the right of inquiry should be absolute. That is, should we dismiss our taboo reactions as a primitive part of our psychology which just get in the way of the mission of these modern institutions of truth-seeking? Or do they deserve some respect that carries over to these formal spheres? I don't know the answer to that question in every case, but I do know that left to its own devices, human nature will be more outraged, more likely to censor, more likely to be victim to the psychology of taboo than would be optimal for the progress of human understanding. And it's for that reason that I'm grateful that we have an organization like FIRE to push back against the tendency in human nature to squelch inquiry under the, mind, the mentality of taboo. Thanks very much. Our next speaker is Harvey Silverglate, who is the co-founder and current chairman of the board of directors of FIRE. He served on the board of the ACLU for over three decades, including two terms as board president. He's currently counsel to Zolkind, Rodriguez, Lunt, and Duncan, a Boston law firm that specializes in criminal defense, civil liberties, academic freedom, and student rights. Harvey has assisted students in trouble since 1969, when he represented student anti-war protesters on trial in Massachusetts. A regular columnist for the Phoenix, he's also published in the National Law Journal, the Wall Street Journal, the Boston Globe, and on and on. He's the author of Three Felonies a Day, How the Feds Target the Innocent, recently published in 2009, and co-author with Alan Kors of the book that really gave rise to fire, The Shadow University, The Betrayal of Liberty on America's Campuses. Um, he is, as I say, someone that I have loved for 40 years. Fair to say? 40 years? And why is that? Um, he taught me, as a somewhat younger lawyer than he was, about the importance of principle, about uh, standing for something, about carving out a life of principle, even though, to be sure, we didn't always agree on the principles, uh, but to do work that one believed in. So part of the, the journey that I have taken, I really attribute um, in large measure to him because he was my model. In addition, our backgrounds were very similar. He likes to talk about how when he was a young man, he used to work in Times Square 
his family sold um, candy in the Times Square movie theaters. And the company didn't go very far because his father called it the New York Toasted Nut House. <laughs> Harvey. It's true my uncle used to answer the phone, nut house. <laughs> uh, <clears throat> thank you all for showing up uh, to celebrate uh, the Fort Hall Forum. Uh, it's a Lewis P. and Evelyn Smith First Amendment Award and this year's recipient, the Foundation for Individual Rights in ed Education, or FIRE. And, and I have to admit that I've always wanted to shout fire in a crowded theater. <laughs> Uh, and finally, I've uh, had the opportunity for which I thank you, uh, the folks who showed up in order to make it a crowded uh, theater. Uh, and I, I thank my uh, dear friend Nancy Gertner of, uh, I think it's, it's four decades or so, uh, for her uh, uh, generous introduction, uh, for what she said and for what she mercifully did not say. Uh, I've been a member of the Fort Hall Forum my entire professional life, and I've come to respect it uh, as the rare civil liberties organization that has meticulously supported free speech in all situations and on all points of the ideological spectrum. And for this reason, uh, this award to fire has special uh, meaning and resonance uh, for me. When Alan Charles Coors and I uh, authored 1998, The Shadow University, The Betrayal of Liberty on America's Campuses, we did not have the slightest idea that the book would spawn an organization and indeed a movement to restore free speech, free thought, and due process to higher education. And when a year later we co-founded FIRE, really as a matter of self-defense, because we could not remedy and deal with all the phone calls we were getting from students and professors who would read our book and realized that there might be help on the way, uh, we could not have imagined what that organization would become. Uh, there is, of course, a sad side to FIRE's longevity. Uh, when Coors and I co-founded FIRE, uh, I thought it would be a rather short-lived undertaking. Why? because our message and our mission carried such a powerful logic that surely it would take only a few short years before we succeeded in our goal of restoring liberty and procedural decency in the academic world. After all, how could it be that an American college student or professor could be punished for uttering words and ideas that others, usually administrators, but sometimes other students and teachers, found offensive or inordinately challenging. How long could disciplinary tribunals continue to exist where students have virtually no chance of demonstrating their innocence, uh, nor that facts are stubborn things and that facts actually matter? How long could our colleges and universities continue to promulgate, uh, promulgate vague codes uh, and operate kangaroo courts that would make George Orwell and Franz Kafka blush? The answer, <coughs> which became clear as we celebrated FIRE's 10th anniversary last year, is that restoring liberty and decency on our campuses is a long haul undertaking. I'm hopeful that I will live to see the day when FIRE is no longer needed. I don't know how long this will take, but I do want to report that I'm taking good care of myself <laughs> in order to improve the odds that I'll be here to celebrate FIRE's dissolution. And I pledge that's one party that I will attend. <laughs> Why is FIRE's mission such an important undertaking? For one thing, education has its own value. Freedoms of speech and thought and conscience are their own imperative. Liberty is a transcendent value, and our campuses of higher education have long been deemed centers of learning where free speech and free thought are essential and are to be given special protection. And so liberty on campus is something we should fight for no matter the consequences. Indeed, without resistance from supporters of liberty, campus administrators can be counted on 
to move from merely censoring what students may say to insisting that students adopt and mouth acceptable points of view even if the students don't believe what they are saying. Let me tell you one of my favorite stories to emerge from my book tour more than a decade ago of promoting the Shadow University. I appeared live on a talk and call -in program on Minnesota Public Radio. It was hosted by a locally well-known moderator who expressed considerable skepticism of my book and suggested that the campus horror stories I was telling were gross exaggerations that were giving undue aid and comfort to politically conservative critics of liberal campus administrators. One story in particular engaged the skepticism of the talk show hostess. I had told of racial sensitivity training sessions at freshman orientation programs around the country in which members of the incoming class during orientation week were asked to line up according to skin color with the darkest skinned African Americans on one side of the room and the fairest skinned blonde haired Caucasians on the other with every hue in between. Each student was then instructed by the facilitator to explain to his or her newly introduced classmates, mind you this was freshman orientation, how his or her skin color had been thus far in life either an advantage or a disadvantage. The political point was that in a racist society, race is destiny. This may or may not be true, of course, but it is a question to be studied and debated. I said on radio, not a required political belief for students to mouth upon being instructed to do so. I suggested that it was the worst possible form of censorship. It was not a mere prohibition against students saying what they believed, but a forced recitation of things that some of the students, at least, did not necessarily believe. Such programs, I said, bridge the gap between mere censorship and full-blown thought reform. As the radio hostess continued to berate me for exaggeration, a listener's call made it through the switchboard, and a freshman at Hamline University in nearby, nearby St. Paul, Minnesota, was suddenly on the air. She had just completed freshman orientation week, she reported, and the orientation sensitivity facilitators had the members of the class line up according to sexual orientation. Straight students on one side of the room, gay students on the other, bisexuals and the confused or uncertain in the middle. The assignment was for each student including the involuntarily newly outed students, to tell his or her classmates how sexual orientation had helped or hindered the student's progress thus far in life. According to these diversity facilitators, sexual orientation more than race was destiny. The talk show ho hostess gasped and dropped the accusation that the Shadow University exaggerated the state of free thought and free speech on campuses. But there's more to it. I've recognized for some years now a relationship between, on the one hand, the vague speech codes that, in, that can entrap virtually any student who says something found offensive by someone, and on the other hand, the laws out here in the real world. What began on our campuses has predictably infected our entire society. What started in Harvard Yard is now rampant in Harvard Square. Just last year, I published my second book, entitled Three Felonies a Day, How the Feds Target the Innocent. It's about how the United States Department of Justice uses vaguely written criminal statutes to prosecute virtually whomever it wishes, since the statutes cannot be readily understood by citizens, some judges may claim to understand them, but I don't, and can be contorted to cover a wide variety of conduct that most of us would consider perfectly legal, even routine. 
I recognize to my horror and to my client's great misfortune that the federal criminal code was being utilized by overzealous prosecutors, much as speech codes were a tool for overbearing ap academic administrators. So here is yet another reason to combat the tyranny on our campuses. Left to its own devices, the campus culture inevitably will influence and infect the entire society. In my view, this has already begun with regard to our laws. So there's still a big job to do to restore free speech, academic freedom, and due process to our campuses. And this award from the Fort Hall Forum is, for the folks at FIRE, a real shot in the arm. It is of enormous importance as FIRE enters its second decade. I thank the forum for this honor bestowed upon FIRE, and I'm delighted that we have, in the forum's judgment, lived up to the high standards of nonsectarian, apolitical, viewpoint neutral, consistent support of free speech, academic freedom, free thought, and due process, values that have likewise characterized America's oldest and most respected free speech forum, the Ford Hall Forum. Thank you very much. Our final speaker uh, is Greg Lukianoff. Did I pronounce your name right? Okay. President of, the, of FIRE. Uh, he's been with FIRE since 2001 when he was hired to be the organization's first director of legal and public advocacy. He's a graduate of American University and of Stanford Law School, where he focused on the First Amendment and constitutional law. Like Harvey and S Professor Pink, uh, Pinker, he has been uh, widely published, Stanford Technology Law Review, The Chronicle of Higher Education, uh, the Boston Globe, He's a blogger for the Huffington Post. I read several of his blogs. He serves as a regular columnist for the Daily Journal of Los Angeles and San Francisco. He's a frequent guest on local and national syndicated radio programs. Before joining FIRE, he practiced law in Northern California, interned at the ACLU of Northern California, and was, and this was sort of an interesting combination, uh, interned at the Organization for Aid to Refugees in Prague, Czech Re Republic, and was the development manager of the environmental projects in Washington, D.C. Uh, he, along with Harvey and David French, co-author Fire's Guide to Free Speech. Uh, uh, there's another entry in his CV, which he'll have to explain. He's a proud member of the board of directors of Philadelphia's Theater Exile. Sounds intriguing. <laughs> I, uh, yeah, I'm on the board of, of uh, directors of Theater Exile. <laughs> I think that's the best I can explain it. Um, so uh, when I went to law school, um, I took every First Amendment human rights uh, and public interest lawyering class at Stanford offered. Um, I did six credits actually on, on censorship during the Tudor dynasty. I, I, I went to law school to do First Amendment law, and so I knew how bad censorship could be. I thought I knew actually. If you told me that I was going to be dealing with the kind of cases I deal with on an almost daily basis at FIRE, I probably would not have believed you. Um, but, you know, I'll, I'll give you some examples. Now, these come from what we call our red alert list. These are the universities that, where we haven't won, where the university hasn't backed down, um, and where we're still actually trying to get the university to do the right thing. So the first on the list is Bucknell University, where about a year ago students were stopped from having a protest of the stimulus of the Obama stimulus plan by handing out monopoly money called Obama bucks. They were stopped. They were claimed this is commercial solicitation, but of course it's political protest, and they're handing out monopoly money. The uh, university has not backed away from this uh, from this decision. Tufts University, actually, particularly in City's case, um, uh, this is a case where during Islamic Awareness Week uh, on campus, a conservative newspaper thought that they were giving an overly rosy depiction of, of Islam. So they wrote an ad um, that actually quoted the Quran and uh, used verifiably true facts, not flattering, uh, mind you, but, but, but verifiably true, um, and they were found guilty of racial harassment. 
um, the university has refused to back down from this finding. Now, there was one thing that was wrong in the um, uh, in this ad. They said that the seven countries that punish homosexuality by death are all Islamic theocracies. There are actually eight Islamic theocracies that punish homosexuality by death. But other than that, it was 100% right. Brandeis, this is right out of a Philip Roth novel. Um, the, the, the school actually named for possibly the most important um, uh, d d lawyer in the history of freedom of speech, as far as I'm concerned at least. Uh, a Latin American studies professor was actually found guilty of racial harassment without a hearing um, for explaining where the term wetback comes from and criticizing its use, but he had to use it in order to criticize it. He was found guilty of racial harassment. Brandeis stands by this. Michigan State University, also on our red alert list, a student wrote several of her professors um, in a very respectful email explaining that she was angry that they had cut down the semester by several days um, and she kept basically wanted her money back. She was found guilty of spamming. Um, the university has made it clear that if she ever tries such political advocacy again, she will be punished. And Johns Hopkins University, which after a impolite Halloween invitation, decided to pass a rule against students being quote unquote disrespectful. Um, some cases that we did win, uh, but just still blow my mind. Indiana University, Purdue University, Indianapolis. A student was, a student employee was found guilty of racial harassment for publicly reading a book. This was only two years ago. He, the book was called Notre Dame versus the Klan. It's a book actually about the defeat of the Klan in a 1924 riot. And it has a picture of a, uh, of the, uh, of a demonstration, a Klan demonstration um, uh, on, on the cover. So literally judging a book by its cover, they found this student guilty of racial harassment uh, because the, the pictures made people uncomfortable. They chastised him for reading, quote, quote, reading a book on a racially aberrant subject. Again, this is about the defeat of the Klan in a 1924 riot. Um, that, but amazingly, that took a combined effort of FIRE, the ACLU, and the Wall Street Journal to actually get the university to back down. And this is a public university. This is the, you don't have to be a First Amendment scholar to know that this is laughably unconstitutional. Uh, Valdosta a University, where a student was actually found guilty, um, uh, 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 he was found to be a clear and present danger for putting a Facebook collage up protesting a parking garage. Uh, the university president had somewhat pathetically referred to the parking garage as part of his quote-unquote legacy. So the uh, student actually made a collage that referring to this as the President Zachary Memorial Parking Garage. That was, uh, the university claimed that that was a threat upon the president's life. They slipped the note under his door and said that he had to g g get mandatory psychological counseling, but that he was also expelled. Uh, yeah, no, just absolutely amazing. Uh, that lawsuit's going on. So meanwhile, we also have speech codes. Um, I, people can be blamed for believing that speech codes went the way of the dodo because there were you know, no fewer than five decisions between 1989 and 1995 declaring speech codes unconstitutional. And I think collectively, and uh, some legal experts did the same thing, said, oh, well, thank goodness that's over. Um, we have a full-time lawyer on staff, constitutionally trained, who actually evaluates speech codes across the country. And so it's, it's a little bit of a tedious job, but it has to be done. Um, and we found that 71% of universities maintain what we call red light speech codes, which, uh, to put it simply, is laughably unconstitutional. But I'll give you some examples. Texas Southern University uh, ban bans attempting to cause, quote, emotional, mental, or verbal harm, which includes embarrassing, degrading, or damaging information, assumptions, implications, and remarks. The code at Texas A&M pro prohibits of people from violating the rights to respect for personal feelings, and I love this one because it just sounds so British, and freedom from indignity of any type. <laughs> Fordham University, for example, uh, prohibits using any e email message to, quote, insult or embarrass, uh, while n uh, Northeastern University, Nat Hentoff School, tells students that they may not send any message that in the sole judgment of the university, that's a quote, is annoying or offensive. But the, the codes that remain, the most common codes, and, and understand that these are the codes that were overturned between 1989 and 1995, are vague racial and sexual harassment codes. I think they rely on uh, racial and sexual harassment codes because people are so sheepish about challenging them. And that's why you end up with ridiculous things like this. Murray State University, for example, bans uh, displaying sexual and or derogatory comments about men, women on coffee mugs, hats, clothing, etc. I have to admit I would really like to see the coffee mug that caused that to get in the policy. 
The University of Idaho bans communication that is, quote, insensitive. Uh, New York University prohibits insulting, teasing, mocking, degrading, or ridiculing another person or group, as well as inappropriate comments, questions, and jokes. Whereas Davidson College sexual harassment policy still prohibits, after ma being made fun of by fire for a decade almost, the use of, quote, patronizing remarks, including referring to an adult as a girl, boy, hunk, doll, honey, or sweetie. It also bars comments or inquiries about dating. I'm not really sure how you date without, without either commenting or inquiring about it, <laughs> but apparently you're not supposed to at Davidson. Now, of course, there is skepticism about our, our number 71%, but this is one thing that I'm proud to say. So far since 2003, there have been 16 challenges, I think actually at this point maybe uh, 17, to codes that we have dubbed red light codes. 100% of them have either been withdrawn or defeated in court. You don't really end up, thank you. So, but I spent all, I feel like I spend most of my time actually trying to convince people that this stuff is happening at all. Um, and it leads me wondering what, what exactly has happened. When, when the Water Buffalo incident happened back in 1993, the, one of the things that led to the writing of the Shouty University, a student yelled out his window, go home you water buffaloes, to a black sorority that had been serenading, as in singing loudly at three o'clock in the morning at Penn. Um, that produced national outcry, um, that international outcry. Uh, Gary Trudeau, and Rush Limbaugh both agreed that this was ridiculous. Um, there was uh, absolute u unanimity on, on how absurd this is. Meanwhile, I have a case where a guy gets in trouble, gets found, found guilty of racial harassment for publicly reading a book, and it barely produces a national shrug. Now, I've given a lot of thought to what is, why this is, um, and, I, and I'm just, it's bizarre to me, um, given that free speech, I consider myself a political liberal, so, do, uh, so does Harvey, that this is increasingly gets treated as a quote unquote conservative niche issue, as if this is not of concern to everybody in the country all at once. Um, I think that, I, you know, I obviously think that free speech is, a, is something that should transcend uh, partisan lines, but. So what are we gonna do to overcome apathy, um, disbelief, uh, and lack of concern? Uh, you know, FIRE, we're a small organization. Uh, when I, w I was the fifth employee, um, and we now have 18 employees. And the th our big initiatives for this year, in addition to the cases that we normally fight, is that we're gonna try to get more, uh, more stuff on video. Um, I'm, I'm tired of people not actually clicking on the documents that proves everything that we say. I want to actually have the student saying, yes, I got kicked out for, writing, for, for posting a collage on Facebook. We need more of that. And meanwhile, I'm actually working on a, uh, I started working on a book um, uh, a couple months ago, uh, sort of a follow up to the Shadow University. And I've been trying to explain, and this makes me a little bit sad, that you actually have to explain why freedom of speech on college campuses matter. Now, initially, what I was thinking of calling the book was Unlearning Liberty, um, which I see hap the students all the time. They're surrounded by speech codes. They get terrible, terrible examples from their, uh, from their administrators. They know stories of people who get in trouble for opening their mouths. Um, and I, I believe that a lot of them have come to believe that censorship isn't just not wrong, it's a romantic end. It's something that good people do. And the most terrifying example of this, and that, that, that happens quite often, is the phenomenon of newspaper theft. And this is something you get very used to when you work in student rights, is that students will get together and they will destroy, and in some cases, burn student newspapers with which they disagree. Um, actually, was, I think it was just two weeks ago where a coach at te Texas A&M actually complimented the football team for going out and destroying a run of a student newspaper that said something critical about the football team. And my feeling, my, 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 my deep belief is that when this generation uh, that actually believes that, that censorship can be a romantic end gets to, uh, eventually gets to lead this country, that the, the, the very underpinning of our pluralistic multicultural society will be threatened. But then I start wondering, but what's actually happening now? I mean, censorship on campus has been going on for quite some time. This is, you know, it, it really uh, stepped up a lot in the 1980s. So I, I wondered, what would Mill, what would John Stuart Mill expect to see if the educated leaders of our country actually grew up in, uh, or were educated in an environment where you could actually be punished for dissent. Um, and I thought about it. Well, you would imagine that it would be a hyper-partisan society where people don't listen to each other at all. They tend to hold their political beliefs um, as rote formulations. They try to prove the emotional truth of, of, of their arguments without being very critical about what they are. They don't really understand why they hold their arguments. They just know they're, they're on this side of the political fence. 
Um, sounds a lot like the society we live in, in my opinion. I think, th and I'm not saying that the, the, the degradation of, a, of American dialogue is, the f is exclusively the fault of higher education. But what I am saying is that the university should be our great hope to overcome this oversimplification, these, the, the, these uh, painful certainties. And it's failing, and it cannot function as, the so as a sophistication machine if people have to fear being punished. Um, so that's actually what I'm going to be working on. Uh, my email is uh, greg at the I always, I always give that out because I always want to hear people's thoughts uh, and, and, and reactions and, and to hear, hear their stories. Um, and we really and, uh, and we deeply appreciate this award uh, and, uh, and, and uh, feel free to write me. Thank you. We're going to open up to questions momentarily. People can uh, go by the mics on either side. I have an opening question. So Professor Pinker, I call you Professor because it's an antagonistic question. <laughs> I'm kidding. <laughs> I'm kidding. Um, talked about taboos, the importance that universities uh, discuss or permit the discussion of truth no matter how uncomfortable. Why? isn't some of the examples that, for example, Harvey gave, uh, universities setting up discussions to confront the taboo of racism. Anyone? Why isn't that exactly what was going on in the training that Harvey described? Is ra racism is a taboo? No, no, you can't someone discuss it? Pro racism, someone who was uh, uh, you know, sort of pro-racial, Profiling pro racial differences, and this was confronting one's feelings about it and one's taboos. Well, if there was a, an open discussion on questions like uh, ought there to be racial profiling using the statistics of racial uh, or national groups to uh, direct resources of uh, police or, or um, homeland security uh, attention, it seems to me that that's a kind of discussion that, that ought to be held. It strikes me that these exercises are not directed to probing the costs and benefits, uh, either moral or practical, of those problems. It, my understanding is that the objection, and maybe Greg and Harvey can speak to that, is that they are intended to indoctrinate students in only one uh, correct opinion rather than to put these positions under a spotlight and examine their merits. But if it was to examine their merits, then it's not clear that that above all should be a mandatory exercise for every freshman, but if it was the subject of a, of a seminar, it sounds like a perfectly appropriate thing to be discussed in a university. Mm -hmm. And that is actually what we object to, is, is when it, it is a mandatory program that actually requires you to, uh, I'll, gi I'll give an example of, of what we would call thought reform. Uh, Michigan State University used to have a program called Student uh, Accountability and Community. Sounds nice. It was developed by the domestic violence uh, branch of, 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 of the uh, faculty at MSU and um, designed to actually root out aggressiveness on behalf of all students. So the kind of thing that would get you mandatory uh, SAC training was, um, uh, the examples they gave was a girl who got in a fight with her boyfriend and slammed a door, someone who was rude to a, to a receptionist, and they had to sit down with a non, not an actual psychological counselor and they had to explain what they did. So they gave the example of the person who was rude to the, ex the, the receptionist. The first th the thing that he said was, I was rude to the receptionist and I shouldn't have been. That wasn't the right answer. Then they gave him the wheel of empowerment and they asked him to, uh, to, to circle, or actually the wheel of disempowerment. They asked him to circle what, what privilege he had actually uh, violated. And the goal was to actually get you, after four sessions that you had to pay for yourself, um, that, uh, you also, uh, that you would be kicked out of if you did not attend, to say it the way they wanted you to say it. And then you, then you got the wheel of empowerment, and then you had to circle things. And it was b just bizarre, some of the things that they actually were, 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 were implicating in it. And the, the correct answer uh, was apparently that I felt, uh, uh, I, I felt entitled to be in the dormitory, and that was wrong. That was the answer that got you out of, psychological of, of pseudo-psychological counseling. Now, as bad as censorship is, um, it's much worse to tell people what they must say. 
Um, and that's and that's what we object to Man- mandatory programs that actually require you. And it's even worse to tell people w- to tell tell you what you must think. Um, and universities have completely uh, so many universities have completely lost this distinction. They saw nothing wrong with the MSU program whatsoever. One question? Qu- is there a question? Yeah. One <coughs> question for Professor Pinker and one for Harvey. Professor Pinker, you. Or were a strong defender of Larry Summers, not not only his right to say what he said, but the content of what he said. Of course, I know you never did back down. Can you tell us what what happened has happened to you in the years since then, uh, from your colleagues? What kind of a uh, how have they treated you? What has been your your uh, your the reaction from your from folks over there? And wha- why is the y- you have not been run out of Harvard? <laughs> and for for Harvey. With regards to certain people who are not allowed to speak on campuses and sometimes run into problems with demonstrators and are shouted down and and their speech is canceled, uh, Norman Finkelstein is one who has run into this kind of problem from time to time. Uh, not long ago, somewhere in, in this area, although he is scheduled to speak at Harvard very shortly, I do believe, have you risen to the defense of, of Mr. Norman Finkelstein, the Holocaust contrarian, who some think is an outright crackpot but you have described as a Holocaust historian. Have you had cause to rise to his defense? Uh, I'll, I'll a- answer uh, uh, briefly. O- of all of the kinds of suppression of free speech and uh, harassment that we've become familiar with, I have, I would have no right and would never uh, dream of complaining about treatment uh, that, that I have received. Uh, my, my colleagues have been perfectly courteous and I've been the beneficiary of, uh, of a, I think, an extraordinarily uh, free system of uh, debate and discussion. So I'm not complaining about that. And with regards to, um, uh, I'd actually know better th- th- than Harvey on, on daily operations for fire. Yeah, th- w- when there have been situations where people have been trying to prevent Finkelstein from speaking on campus, yes, we have r- risen to his defense, just like we have for Bill Ayers and David Horowitz and everybody across the, uh, across the political spectrum. I always like the example of Holocaust denial, though, I have to say, because it's the, it's the one where, they, where, b- where people seem to think it's like a gotcha uh, for, the, for the First Amendment advocate. Um, I actually think that people who, who are Holocaust deniers should actually be heard by everybody because their arguments are ridiculous. <laughs> if you actually hear some of, these, some of these people talk, apparently Jewish-specific yellow fever between 1943 and 1945 was actually what accounted for it under some, uh, under some of these stories. I want everyone to hear that. I want everybody to hear that debate because it's just such a bad argument. You end up giving these people much more power um, if you I- if you actually uh, force them to to, uh, to to whisper in shadows. Over there. Uh, I'd like to ask you about an article that appeared on your uh, website blog last month. Uh, on February 10th, uh, Adam Kissel uh, discussed the uh, case from the University of California at Irvine, which uh, tried to balance the uh, conflict between heckling and uh, free speech. And uh, at th- on that occasion, the Israeli ambassador was giving a speech in pro-Palestinian. Uh, protesters interrupted them on occasion, uh, and finally they were all evicted. Now, the report that we got on your website from Alan Kissel reports everything from the vantage point of quoting a, uh, an organization, an off-campus pro-Israel advocacy uh, organization called Stand With Us. And then he reaches the conclusion, if this account is correct, these disruptive persons may also face the appropriate consequences. And he goes on to say that uh, failing to punish offenders appropriately is likely to threaten the free speech of future speakers by effectively condoning a quote-unquote heckless veto through disruptive actions. That would make a mockery of the First Amendment. And yet Kissel has never for one moment proved that uh, this account is correct because he never bothered to talk to any of the pro-Palestinian uh, hecklers or their supporters. He gives an entirely one-sided, biased account from this Israeli advocacy organization, and from that his conclusion stem, and it was one that was endorsed by organ- your organization a week later. So how can you claim to have an unbiased point of view when you use such biased reporting in uh, your uh, accounts? Okay, well, first of all, I mean, the blog is written by a, a, a number of different people, but you should understand um, that there is actually a video of, the, of, of, of this event that, 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 that I that From I the watched. same advocacy organization, the and not from the protesters. Or the hecklers are there are the so defenders themselves. 
So you're saying that we doctor th- that they doctor the video. Absolutely, I'm saying that. Absolutely, he's not only he's an employee of yours. And uh-huh. he's, he's he's described as a director of individual rights defense program, whatever uh-huh. that means. But I don't see much individual rights defense of the Palestinian uh, uh, protesters there when you use one single source, which is an advocacy. Which uh, which is a video? Wh- which which is the video? Their th- video, which is an advocacy. Which is a video I that think, I think you've made your point. Is you want to add anything, Greg? And I think the you've uh-huh. made. I think it is entirely sir, from them. I, I think you've made uh-huh. your point. Is there? We've defended p- uh, pro-Palestinian s- uh, students under many circumstances. Is there another question? I did. I, I don't want to focus only on one issue. There's another question, please. Go on. Go on. Sure. Um, first, just to start off with a quick anecdote and then segue into a question. Um, I went to Georgetown University undergrad, a private Catholic institution, and there was actually one point at which, um, I think my senior year, when the um, some administrators actually wanted to put a program in place for freshmen that was basically mandatory um, diversity training, um, especially in relation to uh, homosexuality and how it relates to students. Um, it not only was it mandatory, but they're also going to have it if you wanted to get housing uh, <laughs> for next year, you had to attend. And so it was very interesting. It, it didn't end up going through happening, but. Uh, thankfully, but on the question of free speech in private universities, I know um, the fire has sometimes, because uh, there's obviously more limited actions you can take, but y- you sort of have this sort of contractual basis. Yep. If, if a university like Georgetown has a uh, statement of free speech principles, right. um, but then goes and violates that, um, how successful have you been or have you tried? We've actually, it's kind of funny, um, okay, just to explain fi- Fire's position, if, if you believe in freedom of association, that means that people both have the right to form and people have the right to attend really restrictive colleges if they want to. Um, that's just, it's an, it's an inevitable conclusion. Um, but the, the, the thing is, the overwhelming majority of private colleges in, uni- in, in, the, in the country know that they're not going to attract students, so they're not going to attract faculty members if they say that you will have very limited rights here. Only a handful of colleges can do that, like BYU and probably Liberty University. Usually, usually religious schools can get away with that. So universities actually, like Harvard, for example, promise freedom of speech, so does Yale, promise freedom of speech to high heaven. Um, now, if you knowingly give up all your rights to attend a Liberty University, that is ac- you're, you're, ac- you're actually acting within your rights. But if you show up to Brandeis, another example, um, a place that, that, has, that promises freedom of speech in beautiful, beautiful language, um, you, should, uh, you, should expect to, um, uh, you should expect to deliver on those promises, which r- r- creates this kind of funny circumstance that even though you public universities are bound by uh, the First Amendment, I would say that we probably have a somewhat better history in some ways of, of fighting for, for freedom of speech at, uh, uh, at well-known uh, private colleges because um, they actually are just embarrassed about their reputation. They don't want the alumni coming after them saying, wait a second, you're saying that there's no free speech now? Um, so we've, it's actually been extremely successful um, uh, when, it c- when it comes to fighting private s- uh, schools. There's a question over here. Yes, I'm somewhat concerned about the backlash to the Citizens United decision. Many people are now saying that free speech rights belong only to individuals, not to incorporated organizations, which would mean that FIRE doesn't have free speech rights, the ACLU doesn't have free speech rights. I'm interested in the comments from any any of you on this subject. Well, the the ACLU, at least uh, currently and for uh, many years, has uh, positioned uh, that is uh, opposite the result of the Supreme Court decision. Uh, and uh, ACLU has uh, not uh, supported uh, restrictions on, uh, on uh, money in ca- political campaigns. There's a discussion about it now. There was uh, some members uh, of the board were not happy with the Supreme Court's decision, even though it was consonant with ACLU position. And I know ACLU is, is reconsidering it. Uh, I hope uh, that it doesn't change the position. It's a hard position to take, but it's a position that free speech, uh, the First Amendment, I think, requires be taken. There are uh, solutions uh, to the problem of uh, uh, corporate influence in campaigns. Uh, The prior executive director of the ACLU, Ira Glasser, uh, had a proposal for years. It hasn't been really uh, adopted uh, in any sincere way in this country of both a ceiling and a floor, that is the, uh, uh, not a ceiling, but a floor, uh, making it easy 
for minority candidates to get public money to run campaigns, but to not limit the amount of money that can go into uh, any individual campaign. Uh, so we're, we're going to see this played out. I hope it doesn't result in a constitutional amendment that seeks to limit free speech. That would be, I think, a disaster. Uh, I have a question about uh, student newspapers and um, uh, the cases where uh, groups will take the newspapers and throw them away or burn them, destroy them. <coughs> First question is, do the students who are the victims, that mm -hmm. is the publishers, printers, and so on, uh, of the newspapers, have any cause of action as individuals or as an organization against yep. the destroyers or the property, or is the response, well, no, you put a stack of papers, it's free. Right. There's, uh, all right, so that's a problem. Mm -hmm. Th and then my question is, how do you go about uh, protecting those newspapers? Mm -hmm. so. Yeah, uh, it's actually a really great and interesting question. Um, that, uh, there were, uh, um, back in the 90s and still uh, you know, more, more like four five years ago, administrators that when a disfavored political uh, n newspaper would get stolen, the administrator would say, hey, how can they steal it? It's free. And it was an argument that didn't uh, fly very well with the public. So, and that's the interesting thing is sometimes, uh, you know, w regardless of the legality of something that doesn't smell right, if your main job is to actually publicly shame, you can get the universities to back down. And we actually had that at Johns Hopkins um, in another case. But when it comes to how you can protect them through the law, one of the most interesting incidents of this actually came out at UC Berkeley. Um, because at UC Berkeley, the mayor of Berkeley was caught throwing out stacks of the student newspaper that endorsed his opponent. Um, he, was, he was caught doing it. And one of his first acts, as when he was amazingly reelected as mayor of Berkeley, was to pass an ordinance banning the destruction of student newspapers, which I just find 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 very funny. So there are actually laws on the books in in, in a couple states that, that make it, that are very explicit. There's been a strategy of actually um, putting on the on the newspaper saying that um, you you are allowed uh, no more than one person is allowed no more than three copies is an another way that they deal with it, um, which has been you know so so effective. Um, but at the same time, when you th the problem is, of course, that if you have the will to to shut down uh, to destroy a student newspaper, you know, a lot of times people will get away with it. Thank you. Uh, hi, my name is Jeff Stone. I'm a dialogue facilitator. I facilitate dialogues among amongst racially diverse residents, between police officers and teenagers, and I use ground rules for respectful dialogue. And with those ground rules, we have very spirited and very productive discussions. You four panelists, you're abiding by my ground rules tonight. You're being civil. You're, you're, you're not using profanity. Uh, you're sharing airtime very nicely. Okay. So my question is, uh, what are appropriate ground rules or expectations on campus, if any, with regard to, let's say, bullying because bullying is in the news in Massachusetts right now. So let's say bullying others, uh, fellow students, on the basis of race, religion, ethnicity, sexual orientation, for example. And what if such uh, norms of, c of civility are violated? What does uh, the campus do? Uh, just to start out, I know uh, Harvey has some strong feelings about bullying legislation. Um, I tend to agree with Mill that civility is usually what people call someone being uncivil with an opinion they disagree with as opposed to uncivil with an opinion they agree with. Um, that, that, uh, and, uh, and that's, uh, we see civility um, arguments used and, uh, and, and it, 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 it's, it, when you're a First Amendment lawyer, it becomes very disappointing how. But he was asking a different question. He was asking what rules would you recommend to govern that kind of discussion? Uh -huh. Are there no rules well, there at all on campus, uh, or no ex no expectations and no enforcement not in not any way? Not what is bad, but what would you recommend to govern that kind of discussion, okay. or, to, uh, or to at least be pr pr particularly if, if you're talking about a classroom setting, for example, um, if you're talking about something like that, you, we defend the rights of, of professors to actually have tr great power over over their classrooms. Academic freedom actually actually demands it. What we found interesting is that um, we're not talking about ground rules for discussion. We're talking about you know people in, in their own dorm rooms and their own discussions wi wi with each other among That's their own friends. That's what I'm talking about, campus life in general. Ju just, uh, well, th I think the normal uh, limitations that, um, that uh, uh, of, of freedom of speech that you see 
um, but you can't make people be nice. Um, it, 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 and because partially because as soon as you have to start, and that's what I was trying to get to actually, is that if you actually have to tell people uh, who's going to decide what nice is, and it will get used to shut down um, the people who are uh, who have dissenting uh, dissenting opinions. Frankly, I think it tends to get used to shut down people from who who, who have different class expectations. The, if I may, the, these are uh, questions which have been solved long ago in this society. But it's the solutions that have now been undone in the last 25 years uh, by initially by the campuses and now out here in the real world. Uh, what I mean by that is this. The Supreme Court, for example, has said for a long time that speech can be limited in terms of time, place, and manner. Just to give a, a simple uh, explanation, um, if you are uh, – there's a political campaign and you are uh, – uh, campaigning for a particular candidate, uh, you can uh, take your uh, sound truck down a street at 3 o'clock in the afternoon and you can say, vote for Joe Smith. What you cannot do is take that sound truck down that same uh, residential neighborhood street at 3 o'clock in the morning with your loudspeaker. The problem there is not the content or the opinion of the speech. It's uh, the time three o'clock in the morning, the place, a residential neighborhood, and the manor with a sound truck. So we have rules concerning the modalities for having discussions. What happens on the campuses, however, is the content of the speech suddenly becomes prohibited. You've said something hateful, and therefore we're going to stop you from speaking and we're going to punish you. Uh, you haven't said it very loud, you haven't said it at three o'clock in the morning and so forth, but you've said something that is grossly offensive to uh, people. And what we're concerned about is that campuses have gone beyond the traditional time, place, and manner restrictions and have started to censor content and point of view. That crosses a line that no free society can tolerate. So um, uh, that's, I hope I've answered your question. Well, uh, can I just be really briefly specific? Like if somebody is... Uh, calling, uh, 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 using the N-word uh, repeatedly, you know, uh, uh, to black students on campus, or, you know, a bunch of people are doing that. It's offensive, it's wrong, most of us would think that that's wrong, and it can be debilitating to that student if they're constantly hearing that in the hallways. Is there, is that free speech? Yes, and let me tell you, it's not a realistic issue. Uh, you do not have, in college dormitories, people uh, trailing other students down the hallway, yelling racial epithets at them day in and day out. This is the uh, uh, this is simply not real life. But yes, it's of course it's free speech. Saying something that is detested by somebody else, of course, it's free speech. Uh, but let me tell you about an incident that uh, occurred uh, when I uh, was testing out the Shadow University thesis. It was just before, while I was writing my part of the book, it was before it was published. Uh, I went to a uh, Harvard Law School in order to have a discussion uh, with a student group on the subject of wh whether there's a line drawn between harassing speech and protected speech and so forth. And uh, a, uh, a law student who was a first year law student, uh, obviously from Long Island, I can't tell a Long Island accent <laughs> still, uh, got up and he said that he uh, would consider it perfectly okay to ban the use of the M word uh, on, in an academic setting because it would harass black students and cause them to leave the school uh, it, because they were offended. And at that point, a third year law student who was a black uh, student at Harvard jumped up and he was so angry. And I was wondering, uh oh, what's coming now? And what he said to the white student was, look, I went to a very bad uh, school in New York. I was plucked out of it by somebody who gave me a scholarship and sent me uh, out of my neighborhood uh, to a private school. I ended up going to Harvard College, and I am now about to graduate from Harvard Law School. And I want to tell you something. And he looked the guy right in the eye. If you think that I'm going to pack up my bags and go back to the South Bronx because you call me a nigger, you got another thought coming. And that white kid melted like the wicked witch of the West. <laughs> and he learned a real lesson. And I learned a lesson. It helped me with one of my chapters in the Shadow University. Okay. Thank you. Yeah, I want to follow up this bullying issue. 
if I could, just to get clarity on it. If the person who is being bullied is affected psychologically or worse, like suicide, and it's a cause that you can make a relationship between the bullier and the effect upon the person, is administration within that school system providing free speech or not to the bullier? How old are the students you're talking about? I'm talking about high school. Uh, well, the rules for high school students are different than the rules for adults. Pick you, your school. There, there's a reason that If there's fire, a difference, you explain it. Uh, the, there's a reason fire deals with free speech on the college campus, and the reason for that is that in, under the law and under our generally accepted principles, uh, adults have free speech and students, young students, children don't. And we're not so bold as to say that everything should be okay in fifth grade. Uh, but we do think that on a college campus, uh, there's an understanding that free speech is too important to interfere with I in the name of what well, we don't want people to feel bad. You okay. can't run a university like that. Use college as the experience. Mm -hmm. What's the role of the administrator? I, I would think that much depends on what the example of bullying is. If it is libelous, if it's extortion, if it's shouting the student down. Sexual. Mm -hmm. Sexual bullying? Yes. I believe, aren't there laws uh, already there against? Laws. Yes, there are yeah. laws. There are laws, yeah. Well, it, it, it's interesting, because, uh, uh, oh, sorry. Um, so just, just to complete, the, the contrast would be, if a student argues that at the airport security line there should be more scrutiny of uh, passengers with Islamic names than, than without, and if an Arab student feels depressed, harassed, bullied by that argument, that would strike me to be on the other side of the line. So it, it might relate to the question of means, manner, uh, manner, time, time and place, that is if you're actually shouting a student down, or if it falls under these other categories, which my co-panelists can, can educate us about, of where the line is for legitimate restrictions on speech, like extortion, like uh, uh, harassment, like libel. But I would think that the university should have some ability to discriminate the express expression of opinions that might offend a student mm -hmm. versus these other categories where the line is, you're approaching the line where it's no longer speech and more like behavior. I sit on several advisory boards with Professor Pinker. One of them is FIRE, and the other one, and one of the others is the Secular Coalition for America. Um, I actually didn't know you had to do anything when you're on an advisory board. It's amazing <laughs> to see you have you up there working. Um, it's great, I guess. Um, I wouldn't want to do it. Uh, the the Secular Coalition for America represents atheists, agnostics, humanists, and other free thinkers. And we've had some challenges on campuses. And I'm wondering if you have any stories about President Lukianoff, if you have any stories <laughs> about that <laughs> happening. Uh, a absolutely. Um, at, uh, it, was, it was a fun case that actually w w Woody contacted me about. Um, I say fun because it was interesting and meaty. Um, Richard Dawkins was invited to speak at the University of Oklahoma. Um, the uh, several state senators launched an investigation demanding every uh, all information about everything um, th that related to it, what he was paid, um, lo launching an investigation of him and trying to uh, and the, the th at the same time the legislature was trying to pass a bill that referred to evolution as an unpopular and uh, unproven theory and condemning the fact that uh, that Richard Dawkins had, had, had spoken there. Um, it was it was nice because actually I, I got to take a little bit of, of time to be more of a reporter for the Huffington Post and actually reveal this to the to the public and the uh, university didn't uh, uh, sorry the the legislature didn't try anything like that again. But I do have to say I mean I'm I'm not a religious person myself. Um, I I would say that I've seen a lot more cases though of people who are evangelical Christians getting in trouble than I've seen of of, of atheists getting in trouble. And this was a this was a genuine surprise to me um, w when I got when I got to uh, to work at Fire. Um, yes, I'm, I'm glad that some of your remarks more recently have begun to put a context onto your strong defense of freedom of speech. You've now told us that what you're principally talking about is freedom of speech within the university. Mm -hmm. 
which of course is perhaps the easiest context to protect it in. Although I don't think it's entirely easy, actually I think the example that Harvey gave about the black about to graduate from law school student saying he wasn't going to pack up his bags is an unfortunate example in a sense because what you've got is an empowered person who is willing to stand up at that moment. And what I want to ask you about is, what about contexts, historical or otherwise, where what you've got is the powerful who are using their freedom of speech to oppress the less powerful so we can make uncomfortable examples. Would you really support the right of white people in South Africa in the 1990s being able to go around and give speeches about how psychologically and medically and every other which way inferior black people were? Would you really support the right of Germans to go around in the 1930s and tell everybody how terrible the Jews were? So what I'm asking you to do is to, say, is to give us some examples of where the context and the power positions of the speakers and listeners is actually likely to limit your notion of freedom of speech. Once we decide that we are going to have somebody judge context, before we decide on the allocation of rights, we have then lost all liberty because we all know who is going to end up with the power to judge context. It's going to be the cops. It's going to be the DA. It's going to be the dean. Uh, it is not going to be your average student. And so I'm afraid that there is one area of the law where context is not relevant. There are certain limitations on free speech, time, place, and manner limitations. We unfortunately have limitations with regard to uh, sexualized speech. I think that that's a wrong interpretation, but that's where we are right now. Uh, and uh, I do not think context, especially on a college campus. Uh, there are other arguments for the workplace. I won't get into workplace uh, harassment law right now, but on a college campus, uh, context is the enemy of education and the enemy of, of liberty. So I, I think I disagree with the premise of, of your question. I don't know. Yeah, it, it's something that w this is actually a very common argument that fire runs into a lot um, that the administrators use to justify um, their their exercise of power over students that they're uh, th that they're somehow solving um, some uh, historical uh, evil and therefore they should be uh, granted the power to actually censor um, uh, students. So what ends up actually happening with this is, of course, what, they, what, what the administrators end up doing with this power is end up censoring people that they simply dislike or disagree with, and, that's, and that's, that's predictable. So while it has a lot of emotive force to say that we have to consider context, we have to remember that we're still giving people the power to decide what the context is, and those are people in power. Um, and they will use it to, to shut up people they don't like. Um, I'm getting a sign now that we have to stop. I want to thank everyone. I'm sorry that we have to stop at 8 o'clock. And, uh, and I was authorized by the power vested in me by the Ford Hall Forum to stop at 8 o'clock. Thank you very much. <laughs> the Ford Hall Forum was uh, founded by George Coleman, uh, as we said earlier, over a century ago. And in 1915, George Coleman wrote a book about the Ford Hall Forum called Democracy in the Making. Uh, we'd like to show our appreciation to the panelists tonight by giving each one of them a copy of that book. <laughs> our next presentation is uh, two weeks from tonight. It's former Governor Mitt Romney speaking about uh, his new book. Uh, the other sessions following that can be found on the brochure, which you can pick up at the last table, at the back table, I should say. And I hope you've enjoyed it as much as we've enjoyed putting it on. So thank you.
This preceding program was brought to you by Suffolk University. Please visit us on the web at www.suffolk.edu.